Hello and welcome everybody. I'm really thrilled that you all join us again today for our third lecture on planetary health. And today we're going to explore the field of planetary health ethics. I'm really excited that we have a group of really interdisciplinary speakers today. And ethics is a topic that suits well, very well into Christmas time as well, the turn of the year, because during these days, people often slow down a little bit, take days off and reflect over the past month and how they might like to start uh, into the new year. And therefore, I would also do two announcements, actually, because suppose you consider getting more engaged in the topic of planetary health. In that case, you're very welcome to join our international body program. We launched it last week during, the, uh, during our international exchange meeting, and we're really glad to connect you with other participants from the Planetary Health Academy. If you're interested, you can find more information on that on our website in the section Get Involved. And furthermore, if you like our program, we would be really, really gratified about your donation as a kind of a Christmas gift. The Planetary Health Academy is for free. Still, as an organization, we rely on funding and volunteers. So every donation supports our work towards healthy people on a healthy planet. More information on that you can also find on our website uh, in the upper left corner, actually. So that for announcements, and now let's start. Today, we would like to explore the ethics of planetary health and political action with you. And I'm delighted to introduce Kai Speakerman to you. On this occasion, also, I would like to thank Felix who brought you, Kai, into the game. And that's actually my dog, Mia. <laughs> he might look into the camera sometimes. And as this is a Planetary Health Academy, we like to include like everybody and every animal as well. So Kai, you convinced Felix with your lectures, so to say, at the London School of Economics, and you're a professor of political philosophy in the Department of Government at the LSE. You're working on democratic theory, and uh, you also wrote a book on epistemic theory of democ democracy. Maybe you can explain to us later what that is exactly. And among others, you're interested in the ethics of environmental change and group decisions, two topics that really fit very well into planetary health. And as a question to start, like out of your opinion, Kai, do you think climate change related issues can be solved by democracies? Or do you think other political systems can handle them much more efficiently? Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and, and thanks very much for, for having me uh, at this uh, wonderful event. Uh, okay, so I mean, this is a really difficult question to start with, right? So democracies tend to be quite good when it comes to problem solving and uh, working through problems collectively. Uh, that in a way is what a democracy is made for. Uh, the, the issue with climate change is that uh, it's not just about problem solving, it's also about implementation, especially long-term implementation. And long-term thinking is something that uh, most democracies really struggle with. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is an inherent property of democracy, but it, I think it is a property of how we run democracies right now. So in short electoral uh, cycles and in you know, a media landscape that works in much shorter cycles even, uh, democracies struggle to focus on long-term issues. Uh, and that, that is one big problem. The other big problem is that democracies struggle to uh, think about uh, long-term ethical issues in particular, like intergenerational justice, which, which of course is, is crucial for climate change. Uh, so, um, I, mean, if you, I mean, if I had to, if I had to guess, then I think that democracies could probably reinvent themselves to um, deal with a problem like climate change. Uh, but major authoritarian states also have a good shot at it simply because for them it's so much easier to take focused action. Uh, so I, I think it's actually a close call. But you're going to tell us still like why it's worth engaging politically, aren't you? In your oh, life? absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 So 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 that's that's the thought. I mean, I mean, to some extent, you sort of uh, you sort of spurred me on and piqued my interest a little bit because uh, when we first talked. Uh, I mean, my philosophy reaction was, oh, I'm going to talk about, you know, the details of climate justice and all the different justice uh, kind of aspects of it. And you said, no, we want something about action. And so I'll try to talk about action. I mean, even though, of course, I'm talking from a philosophical perspective and 
philosophers always work from the armchair in the end, uh, but that doesn't mean that I can't give some instructions on how to leave the armchair as well. Okay, then let's start. I would okay, say. It's yours. <laughs> let's 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 get going. Let me share my screen, and and here we go. So, I call this. Um, um, short uh, talk, um, growing our uh, sense of feasibility. Um, and I will explain in a moment what I, what I mean by feasibility. And ultimately the goal is indeed to explain a little bit um, how we can sort of increase our space uh, for action by uh, trying to understand a bit better um, what is feasible in this world uh, and how to fight arguments that say, oh, this just cannot be done this is just not feasible. Um, I will come to the conclusion that sometimes these arguments have their justification, but quite often they're just a piece of political rhetoric uh, that we should really put to the side. Now, um, I want to start with something that is really uh, dear to my heart. Um, and this um, is um, um, a novelist. And uh, so here we have him, uh, Robert Musil, an Austrian um, author, um, lived from 1880 to uh, 1942. Uh, and he has written this absolutely amazing, um, actually unfinished novel called uh, The Man Without Qualities, or in German, Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften. You will need a really quite, uh, you know, free Christmas break to uh, finish this book. Um, it's, it's big, but it has, um, wonderful, wonderful philosophical undertones. And I'm interested in Musil today because he's talking about a certain sense uh, and he calls it the, the sense of possibility. So um, he says, but there is a sense of reality and no one will doubt that such a sense has its rightful place. But then there must also exist something which one could call a sense of possibility. Or if I may very briefly in German, Wenn es aber eine Wirklichkeitssinn gibt und niemand wird bezweifeln, dass er seine Daseinsberechtigung hat, dann muss es auch etwas geben, das man Möglichkeitssinn nennen kann. So this sense of possibility, this uh, Möglichkeitssinn, this is ultimately um, what interests me today. Okay, so um, we are often told when um, we um, present political proposal that um, certain ideas and especially sort of normative proposals, you know, we should design, you know, democracies like this, or we should create global justice like that. These sorts of um, proposals are often um, met with resistance and a typical counter argument that uh, people try to make is that is just not feasible. Now, I think it's definitely the case that um, there's something sensible about uh, uh, these sorts of arguments. So uh, for a start, um, we just cannot ask people to do things um, that they cannot do. Um, that would be pointless. So um, if someone asked me to reduce my CO2 emissions to zero by next month, uh, then um, not only would I have to decline, uh, but it's also questionable. Indeed, it's unlikely that I actually have an obligation to do this because I simply can't. It is just not available to me as an action as things stand right now. So uh, philosophers like to you know, give names to things and define things. So let's call this the feasibility argument. So um, it's not feasible, not fe feasible to phi implies that it is not the case that one ought to phi. So in a nutshell, if you can't do it, it's not the case that you ought to do it. The problem is that the feasibility argument is very often abused. So infeasibility gets asserted when there actually isn't much infeasibility. Uh, maybe things are difficult, but something being difficult is not the same as it not being feasible. And there's another sort of more philosophical subtlety here. So um, just because an obligation to perform a certain act, so to phi um, is void, does not mean that it wouldn't be desirable uh, to bring something like phying into the world. So in my CO2 case, it would be enormously great if I could uh, reduce my CO2 emissions to zero uh, next month. Maybe it's not available uh, for me as an action right now, but that does not mean that it's uh, not a desirable target um, for the longer term, for example. 
Okay, so um, this is sort of a general kind of overview of the notion of, of feasibility. Uh, just to connect this to climate change a little bit and maybe um, um, the, the global problem that we face here. Um, so many of you will, will know this. So, um, oh, I think the screen sharing has cut off the source, um, uh, but this is from the climate action tracker. And uh, what we can see here is our uh, historical CO2 emissions. Ah, there's the source. And um, you can uh, also see uh, the current policies and what is projected in terms of warming, namely a warming between 2.7 and 3.1 degrees Celsius, uh, based on sort of middle of the road uh, scenario calculations. Uh, the current pledges and targets bring this down a little bit, 2.6 degrees. If you then include the net zero targets that have recently been announced, um, then we might get to 2.1 degrees if we're lucky. We're still quite a bit away from the targets that we really need to reach. Um, something like 1.5 degrees Celsius is what we really want. And one interesting question one can ask here is, is it really feasible uh, to make uh, these sorts of cuts that would be necessary? And I will try to argue today, well, I mean, it may well be very difficult, um, but uh, we should resist the argument that it is just not feasible. The next conceptual point I want to make is that feasibility comes in degrees. Uh, that's important to realize because many people might mean different things when they talk about feasibility. So imagine um, this sketch here as sort of an indicator of um, um, how far uh, we are from the current world. So let's say the actual world is here and the more you go outside into these spheres, um, the further we are away from the current state of the world. It's maybe easiest to start from the outside. So um, at the very sort of outside edge of our feasibility conception is everything that is feasible according to the laws of logic. Uh, so that's a really wide uh, uh, conception of, of feasibility. Uh, a second conception would be if you also add the laws of nature, constraining your feasible set a little bit more. Uh, another conception of feasibility arises when um, you add the fixed aspects of human psychology. So what does this rule out? So for instance, assuming that people are entirely selfless. Uh, so that people are basically angels or so. So that's out and then our sort of feasible set uh, reduces a bit further. Um, or you also add current preferences, current norms, current background institutions, and then you get an increasingly narrow um, feasible set and depending on what precisely you assume here you can really you can really make it quite small and again my point will be um, yes you have to find a sensible notion of feasibility but don't make it smaller um, as you really have to make it because otherwise um, um, you sort of kill your ambitious projects uh, right from the start so that uh, that would be bad so here are some bad feasibility arguments a really bad feasibility argument is it is unlikely to happen, therefore it is not the case that there ought to. So lack of likelihood does not imply um, that something is not feasible and therefore also does not imply that we have no obligation to do it. Or even worse, I do not have the willpower to do it, therefore it is not the case that I ought to do it. Uh, of course, that's also equally implausible. So just because I don't have the willpower to, don't know what, um, bring the rubbish out this morning doesn't mean that I can't do it. There's a famous uh, example in the philosophical literature on feasibility. So the philosopher David Estlund uh, here on the uh, bottom uh, right um, um, says, well, um, it's unlikely uh, that I'm going to dance like a chicken in front of my classroom, uh, but it is definitely feasible for me to do so. So. Um, Yes, in the same way, we should uh, really not take very seriously arguments that um, start from um, um, just a lack of willpower. And of course, you can see that this is also relevant for uh, many of our uh, important life projects, like maybe uh, going vegan or committing to less air travel and so on and so on. All these things um, are uh, difficult and we need a lot of willpower for it. Um, and it might also be the case that they are unlikely to happen, um, especially if you don't have the willpower. Um, but just because something is unlikely to happen or because it's hard does not mean that we don't have an obligation to do so. 
here's a scenario that's a little trickier. So if everybody did the right thing individually, we could jointly do it. But given the incentive, some won't. And therefore, it is not the case that we ought to do it. Well, I say this is a little bit trickier because now suddenly it's not just about one individual action or one individual actor. It is suddenly about the group. And group dynamics are complicated. But again, uh, I would argue that uh, just because it's difficult to get groups to do things doesn't mean that they have no obligations to um, do the things that are necessary. So for instance, if everybody cooperated, we could together reduce emissions from air travel by 80%. But many of us won't, so we can't actually achieve it and therefore it's not required. That strikes me as an eminently implausible argument. Okay. So let me then change gear a little bit and say something about what we uh, can do together and why we can do much more uh, than one might think uh, after initial analysis. So when we think about our normative theories, about our philosophical theories, about how the world ought to be, then we, first of all, we think in long time horizons, we allow for extensive social change and we include the change of all kinds of background uh, frameworks and institutions like norms, like preferences and so on. So um, what is for us feasible in the here and now should only minimally constrain what is feasible in the longer term. Well, and why? Well, because metaphorically speaking, we build scaffolds. We change the world one bit at a time. So for example, it's not feasible for me to climb my house right now. Uh, but it is for, feasible for me, potentially with others, to first build a scaffold and then climb my house. And in the same way, um, we can also make bigger changes in the world. So we first have to set goals and then we have to uh, create structures and then we have to change things one by one. And if you take into account all the different changes that can be made over time and allow for the you know, extensive social change that can be brought about eventually, um, then we build these metaphorical scaffolds and we can really change the world uh, much more than we might initially think. Now, some might push back here and say, well, you know, um, what you have not really talked about yet are compliance problems, namely problems of the nature that people just won't cooperate um, in such large scale projects. And indeed, that is a core issue when it comes to um, fighting climate change. So climate change is a hard problem because it is perceived as a cooperation dilemma. So letting others do the hard work, uh, the emission reduction is always initially attractive. Well, why? Because um, the individual benefits from reducing emissions are relatively tiny and uh, most of the effects are uh, um, external to others. So we have a classical sort of external effects problem. Um, and even worse, the largest benefits are experienced by future generations and not by us. So from this, some uh, may argue that uh, certain prescriptions are just not feasible because this cooperation dilemma uh, cannot be overcome. But I think this is also mistaken. Uh, it is mistaken because we have influence over how we perceive this problem. So the shape of the decision problem in itself is something that we can control. So we can create the preferences towards cooperative and altruistic attitudes. Um, that is something that we can change. We can also create the social norms that condemn excess emissions and wastefulness. Again, something that we can change. And we can also reshape our economies, ec economies to make mitigation uh, cheaper and emissions more expensive. Again, this is a structural thing that we have in our hands that we can change. So in other words, we can build scaffolds to reduce the compliance problem and make it much less severe than it might initially look. Now, um, I have a few minutes left, so um, maybe I'll link this briefly to um, um, one sort of influential and controversial uh, book on, on climate change justice, a book by uh, Posner and Weisbach. So Posner and Weisbach um, argue that um, uh, global climate change treaties should be what, compatible with what they call international Parisianism. So they say, and here I quote, uh, any treaty must satisfy what we shall call the principle of international Parisianism. All states must believe themselves better off 
by their lights as a result of the climate treaty. And then they say, and that's of course interesting now for me, feasibility rules out the vast redistribution of wealth that many believe are morally required. Well, at this point, I'm sure you already know what I'm going to say. This is just a really terrible feasibility argument because why should we accept an unwillingness to go beyond Pareto improvements as in feasibility? It just doesn't make much sense. So let me then say a few things about what we can do to change the world. Some of these points will be fairly obvious um, and others uh, maybe slightly less so. Um, although in the end, I mean, since you're all thinking about how to change the world, um, none of this will totally surprise you, I believe. So first of all, we can persuade others of the urgency and the ethical requirement to reduce emissions. And uh, those people who have persuasive power uh, and can uh, influence others have a special obligation to do so. Secondly, when individual action fails, as it often will, when you deal with something so big uh, as climate change, you should take the necessary steps to form a group agent and act as a group agent. For instance, uh, a planetary health academy, right? Um, so form a group agent and get organized. Third point, change social norms so that excess emissions just become socially unacceptable. So our whole world is shaped by social norms that uh, determine uh, what is acceptable, acceptable, what is not acceptable. We can achieve something similar in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Change institutions. So we talked about long-term thinking at the very beginning um, of this talk. Promote institutional global cooperation. And then finally, that is perhaps um, slightly uh, more surprising, engage in what uh, uh, the Germans, uh, but even now the English philosophers call ideologie critique. So try to unmask belief systems that uh, help to occlude the wrongs that are associated with excess emissions. Uh, criticize those who tell us um, that, um, oh yeah, it's going to be fine. We're going to find some sort of technical fix in the near future or criticize those people who tell us, ah, uh, we can all continue flying around the world. We just need to buy some voluntary offsets. That sort of stuff is not just, uh, you know, misleading for some, it is actually systematically um, preventing us from realizing or preventing others from realizing what kind of actions are ultimately required. And also criticize the framing of the problem in purely rational, competitive, uh, or monetary ways. Um, because that uh, makes us fall back into the compliance problem. Uh, we want to reframe the issues in ways uh, that make it easier for people to solve the compliance problem and not just set it up as this sort of prisoner's dilemma um, that we have often been told is actually, um, is actually the main problem here. So to go back to, to, to Robert Musil then um, and his uh, Möglichkeitssinn, um, I would say that there are many excellent reasons for um, using one's sense of reality, one's Wirklichkeitssinn, when shaping or debating public policy. Um, I mean, the climate system, of course, is uh, imposing a very important reality on us and we cannot ignore it. But the climate change problem can only be successfully addressed by building scaffolds to increase what is feasible. And by reshaping um, the climate change problem, into one that escapes or at least mitigates the social dilemmas associated with it, we can ultimately overcome it. Or at least that is my hope. So um, my goal is really to have shown to you that um, we should resist bad feasibility arguments and we should widen our sense of feasibility. Um, and I hope to have given you some practical tools for doing so as well. And that um, is the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kai. I really like the scaffold picture, building scaffold. And I think with uh, Kathy Wabnitz and Teddy Potter, we have a really good example also of two people who are really building scaffolds. But before we get into the Q&A, um, to your talk, I would like to hand over to Jennifer Cole and we will hear another input from her and we will do the Q&A afterwards. So feel free also to ask your questions and post them into the chat. So. Welcome to you, Jennifer. I would like to do a short introduction as well for you. So 
just a few sentences. You're a research fellow currently at Royal Holloway. That's one of the universities in London. And you also have a quite interdisciplinary background. You studied, uh, in, uh, wait a minute, you studied yeah, biological anthropology at Cambridge University. And you also have another, I could say like background for your PhD, which is in computer science and geography. And you also work together with other um, health or public health policy advisors for the Rockefeller Foundation Economic Council on Planetary Health. And you also co-wrote in the chapter on planetary health ethics and Samuel Meyer's book. And you also have your own book on planetary health, which is really good, actually. Like okay. if anyone's interested, I can highly recommend it. So also one question for you to start because you have such a broad background and you could have chosen like any topic. I, could say like what brought you to the topic of planetary health ethics what was so fascinating about it for you um, that's essentially what i'm going to take you through um, in the presentation okay. is, is kind of how we came to that but it was really identifying something as important as planetary health didn't seem to have a, an underlying code of ethics um, and we thought it we needed one um, and that's i've managed to explain in a sentence um, what i'm going to try and spend the next 20 minutes <laughs> um, ex explaining to you um but but that was it essentially it was that we felt that something so important needed to have a, a kind of an ethical baseline so everybody knew where they were starting from um and everybody knew everybody was kind of in agreement on what those those ethics were then let's get started i would say <laughs> okay Okay, can you all see that? Perfect. Yeah, we yeah. See that. yeah, so as I said, and thanks for introducing me. Um, and the reason that I was approached for this was, was basically, I, I was one of the co-authors um, of the ethics text, uh, the ethics chapter in Sam Meyer's textbook, which if you haven't seen it, is that one. It's, as you can see, it's kind of quite a large book. Um, and Sam wanted a chapter on ethics and myself and some of my colleagues at Oxford had previously written a, a paper on ethics um, for the Challenges Journal, which is essentially the journal of the in vivo planetary health network, if you're familiar with that network. Um, and what I really wanted to do in this, this lecture was take you through the process of how we came to have written the article for Challenges in the first place, kind of why we felt that ethics was important and then how we developed that from the paper that initially went into the challenges um, journal to the one that ended up in the planetary health textbook. So if I, I'm not quite sure why it's not moving on. Yes, so I'm not going to give you too much of an introduction to planetary health because obviously you all know what it is, um, but it's a reasonably new field. Um, and obviously when new fields emerge within academia, they tend to have different groups that come from different backgrounds most of the people involved with the the lancet part of planetary health tend to come from a public health background we're seeing increasingly people coming from environmental backgrounds so the, the wildlife conservation society recently had the, the large conference in germany and there's also the in vivo network who also tend to come from perhaps sometimes a more spiritual and perhaps arts-based background um, and so you've probably again seen this diagram from Sam Myers, but one of the things that Sam identified in planetary health is these the mediating factors. You can see the, the blue um, squares on the diagram. And the, these are basically things that mediate planetary health. So you have governance, wealth, philosophy, culture and behavior, technology. Um, and really, if you don't have those, you're not going to turn planetary health into action. Academics can sit down, they can talk about what planetary health can be, they can theorize about planetary health um, for as long as they like. But as Kai said, if you don't actually get up from your computer and go and do something, um, you're never actually going to change the world. And it's really the mediating factors that enable you to change the world. So one of the things that I did on the project at Oxford is we looked back over the first year of the Lancet Planetary Health um, and by then it had published altogether just over 100 articles. And we, we tried to look at the articles and see if there was a reason why these articles had been published in Lancet Planetary Health rather than just in the Lancet. You know, why had there been a need for a, a new publication and, and what type of articles um, came out of that? And one of the things that we identified is that 
virtually every article that was in the Lancet Planetary Health looked at both a human health aspect and an environmental health aspect. So they, they were very much about how this tied together, but that also was very similar for the Lancet itself. So it may look at how air pollution impacted respiratory disease or how diet influenced obesity and influenced heart disease. Uh, but the additional thing that there seemed to be in the Lancet Planetary Health articles as well, was this more social dimension. They tended to, in, to include the, some of those mediating factors and they fell reasonably neatly into an organizational um, concept that, that most people are aware of, kind of, certainly within management and organization studies, of this idea of political, economic, social, technological, ethical and legal. So that if you actually want to get something done, you really have to address it through one of these frameworks. So you, you, have to either address it through policy, through economic tools, through social norms and behaviour, through technological solutions, through laws and, and regulations, or through ethics. Um, and what we saw from the articles that were there is that on the one hand there was, there was quite a big um, focus on economic, which was good because the, the project I was working at on Oxford was essentially an economics driven project. Um, it was the Rockefeller Fa Economic um, Council for Planetary Health. But the one that really seemed to be missing and really none of the articles in Lancet Planetary Health were covering was the ethical side. So we almost had this structure that Planetary Health had identified was the way to get things moving, to actually get action. And yet one of the really important components of that was missing. So our feeling was that if the ethics of Planetary Health were missing, the obvious thing to do, particularly from an action-based perspective, was to actually go out and draw up a code of ethics. And if code of ethics didn't exist, then we would write one. Um, so we, we went about, we, we set about writing a code of ethics. Um, and that was, it's kind of started off really with us, I mean, literally talking around the water cooler in the coffee room as to what we thought this should be. Um, and what we decided was that we would start off with a first draft. And that's because what we found was that very much if you start off with, if you put something in front of people, they start to criticize it. And sometimes, you know, particularly with academics, putting something in front of people that they criticize is the best way to actually get the best response. Um, so we did a first draft and we very much put it out there as a talking point um, and for people to come back and to discuss with us and to contribute to with the promise that there would be further iterations of this, that this was very much our, our first attempt. Um, and one of the things that was immediately very interesting with that is we put it into the challenges journal because they also had a conference um, and that so we thought if we put it into the in vivo networks publication we could then also present it at their conference and we could get you know very live debate going we could get people to comment on it then but obviously in order to go into an academic journal it had to have the usual academic rigor behind it and it had to be aware of what other academics had said about the topic, um, other thoughts and behaviors that were going on. And between when we submitted the paper and when it came back from peer review, the in vivo network had also worked on and published some principles of planetary health. And so one of the first questions they asked us is that if there is now a set of principles of planetary health, why do we also need ethics? And is there a fundamental difference between ethics and principles? And to some extent, the honest answer would have been, there's probably not, but we didn't know that when we submitted the paper um, and just withdraw it. But actually we thought we'd try and come up with a way as was there a difference between ethics and principles if we read through the literature. And what we found in that reading through some of the literature is there was a feeling that principles are very personal, that you can be very principled about something. And that's your stance and your belief. So, for instance, you may be very principled about being a vegan, but the ethics actually have to be more collective, which Kai mentioned as well. And the ethics really have to be held by society. They have to be held collectively. And that one of the things that ethics can actually do very well is it can set a baseline which you yourself may not be entirely comfortable with, but you understand that that is collectively where at the moment the bar is being set. And an, an example of that would be, perhaps again, going back to veganism as an example, you may be very principled about veganism, but you also accept that going and creating sabotage or bombing a meat factory is not acceptable to society. 
And so you express your veganism through the norms of society that you know are acceptable and you don't step behind, beyond that. So that for us was a very, to begin with, it, it was very important. What it showed is we actually had to be looking at something that was, was very collective, that worked for everybody. And also within that, ethics could change over time. Ethics were also context dependent, which again, principles didn't necessarily need to be. Um, and so that what was considered to be ethical now may not have been considered ethical 100 years ago and may not be considered ethical in 100 years time. And something that struck me very much about that when we then presented this paper at the, the Invivo conference is that the conference took place in Detroit in the, head, in the headquarters of General Motors. And I actually felt extremely uncomfortable as a planetary health academic presenting a conference in the headquarters of a company that was arguably one of the worst polluters of the world. And, and I actually did kind of raise that, that I felt very uncomfortable about that. And that whether in a hundred years time, that would be something that we would have to address now. You know, I'd rather have it on paper now that I felt uncomfortable with that than have that questioned in a hundred years time. We saw recently in the UK with the Black Lives Matters protests in a lot of uh, cities, um, statues were pulled down of people who'd been involved with the slave trade. Because at the time, although they were philanthropists, they may have built civic buildings and civil schools, the industries they're involved with is no longer ethically acceptable for them to be literally put on a pedestal. Um, and I wonder whether in 100 years time, this will be the same with bit companies now, such as General Motors, that there will be a, an ethical backlash against even the history of those companies that is very dependent on the context. Um, and so the ethics were both collective at the time, so they went beyond the individual at the time, but they were also very time and context dependent. And we had to be very aware of that. But we did come up with a set of ethics um, and we chose to how you know, we had to decide how many ethics we were going to have and how we were going to kind of order and structure these. And we went for a 12 step program for Earth is what we uh, initially we called it, the, the 12 step program for Earth. And there were really two reasons why we chose those, that 12 step program. Um, and the one was that 12, you may be aware that the, the idea of the 12 step program is something quite often comes from addiction. It's used by Alcoholics Anonymous, it's used by drug rehabilitation groups. Um, and it's really these kind of 12 steps to recovery. So it, it was about something that was damaged, something that was broken that had to be repaired. So we liked it from that point of view. It's also very much about change. The, the 12 steps of these drug rehabilitation, alcohol rehabilitation programs actually come from the ideas of alchemy, the Middle Ages, which was a, a Middle Ages esoteric movement that was very much about change. It, it's quite often only remembered now as the idea that the alchemists could change base metal into gold. That was never actually meant to be a literal translation of what it was. The idea is that you could take something that was worthless, something that was kind of clumsy and lumpy, and you could turn it into something better if you nurtured it and really understood it and, and saw its value. Um, and so that this idea of the 12-step program, we, we felt really spoke to those. It spoke to this idea of changing something, of making the best of what you had and making something better, and also of repairing and recovering from something that was damaged. And also the, the other reason that we took that was that the Lancet itself, um, when the Lancet did its review on planetary health, it, it came up with these three ideas. <clears throat> sorry, which were imagination challenges, which is, can we really conceptualize the scale of the problem? Is, is this sort of something we can't even imagine? Which again, would go back to some of Kai's ideas around feasibility. Um, and then if we could imagine it, did we know enough about it? So did we have all the data that we needed to move forward? And then if we did have all the, if we could imagine what it was, we had all the data we needed, how did we then implement that? And one of the things that the Lancet um, Commission identified was that the implementation challenges are really where we have the biggest issue. It's where we're struggling the most. Um, and the project that I worked on at Oxford was actually meant to be part of that implementation. It's coming up with an economic toolkit that incentivizes the solutions that will, will solve the problems. Um, so we, ha we had really three key headlines within the Lancet with a 12 step program, which allowed us to put four ethics under each of those three headings. So we came up with 12 ethics under each of those three headings. And then the idea was that what we would do said is we would start a dialogue and we would start debates, we would start communication with other people in the, the planetary health network as to what they thought about those. Um, it didn't actually go successfully as we hoped. We, we went through a number of 
ways of trying to do that. We had the article itself, we spoke at the conference, we created a, a subreddit where people could go and, and vote on the ethics and add to them. Um, and we actually didn't really get a lot of engagement from that, which we weren't really sure whether it was to take that people liked the ethics as they were and therefore didn't really think there was a need to change them um, or whether we just hadn't really managed to reach people in the same way. But one thing we were very aware of um, is that most of the ways that we'd been intended to engage were very easy for people in Western Europe and in the United States. They were very digital, they were very online, they involved going to conferences, but we were concerned as to whether or not we'd actually made it easy enough for the Global South to contribute. So the four of us who were co-authors on the paper, all of us were involved in some field work somewhere in the Global South. And one of the things that we decided we would do is every time we were on field work in the Global South, we would actually take the ethics in a written form and we would try and have some kind of community engagement with Global South communities to ask their opinion of their ethics and to make sure that we were actually allowing those voices to be heard of people who couldn't come to international conferences, who weren't interacting online, who weren't necessarily part of the, the academic um, networks that, that we were normally part of. Um, and my own field work at the time that tied into this was in Malawi in Africa. Um, so one of the things that I did was run a focus group on this in Malawi. And as you can see on the map, Malawi is it's a landlocked, it's a landlocked country, but it has a, a large Lake Malawi that runs almost the entire southern border. So although it's landlocked, it has a lot of water available to it. It's a very, very beautiful country. It's a very poor country in terms of cash resources but it has a huge amount of national capital. And one thing that Malawi is really waking up to is the value of its natural capital and how actually it can reposition itself as a tourist destination, as a conservation destination, as a place of natural beauty that gives it a resource that it's never had before. It doesn't have oil, it doesn't have diamonds, it doesn't have the things that traditionally have been traded, but what it does have now is something that can bring people to Malawi. So it's take on planetary health, potentially is very different to ours. And we, we ran a consultation there with the ethics. Um, and you can see, these are just kind of some of the, the photos I took of the, of the natural beauty of Malawi. Um, but it also has some of the problems with consumerism that the rest of the world has. You know, it's starting to have a lot of recyclables, but also because it doesn't have good energy infrastructure, there is a lot of incentive to actually have small solar power panels in the villages to actually have renewable energy sources that are off grid. Um, there's a lot of recycling of clothes there. A lot of recycled clothes from the West go to Malawi. Um, and so that there is a lot of, of sustain, so a lot of the sustainability is actually tied up within recycling, reuse of materials. <clears throat> sorry, and more sustainable consumerism. So one thing we were interested in is, could you actually encourage this sustainability and reusability right from the beginning without actually going through some of the, the most damaging parts of the consumer development cycle? Um, we were staying in a, an absolutely beautiful mountain lodge and the people that we engaged in the consultation process were largely the, the mountain guides who'd been working as their local research assistants on the project. They were really acting as guides and translators and drivers, um, but they knew the area very well. They were involved in some of the conservation projects itself. So they, they were really the people who this was affecting at, at ground level. Um, and one of the things we asked them to do, we got them to rate the ethics and to say which ones they thought were the best and which ones they thought were the worst. And it was really interesting, not only which ones they picked, but the reasons that they picked them. So if, if we look at the best ethics, um, I won't kind of read them out in, in general. Um, but one of the ones I really liked was this idea that humans were custodians of the planet, not masters. And actually we had to look after it and make sure that we didn't damage it and passed it on to future generations in the way that it was left to us. Um, and that, you know, the idea that future generations had equal rights was very, very important to them. And that was particularly from countries that hadn't always been equal on the world stage themselves. They often felt they hadn't had equal voices in international treaties and in international discussions. And so this idea that we were looking at, at equity, not only now, but to future generations went down very, very well. Another one they really liked um, was that it had to be a way of living that people would engage with. 
and that you this wasn't again something that was just kind of strategic and that it, it was put into government documents as a nice idea it actually had to be practical we had to look at how this would affect people on the ground and you know, how could they actually live with this day to day and if they couldn't live with suggestions that we were making day to day if we couldn't change tomorrow without significantly disrupting their way of life it wasn't ethical to do it and that's been really interesting with some of the work that i've been doing over the last year with wet markets there's been an enormous call to shut down wet markets, particularly because they were seen as, as perhaps one of the drivers of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the areas of Assam in India, where I work, if you shut down wet markets, people would have nowhere to sell their produce and they would have nowhere to buy food. And you can talk about hygiene and you can talk about illegal wildlife trades for all you want to in elite chambers of commerce across the world please don't tell me to shut down wet markets until you have actually gone out and seen and lived with the communities who have no other source of food. Um, and so that, you know, making sure that people's lived experience is taken into account in these ethics was also very important. If we look at the less good ethics, the ones they liked least out of the ones they, they were given, um, one of the ones that they really didn't like um, was this one where we talked about realignment with human evolutionary history, this idea that development had gone too far and we somehow needed to scale back. And they felt that was very difficult for them because Malawi as a country hasn't developed as far as it needs to. When you're living in a country when, where most people don't have access to basic health care, most people don't have basic access to basic water and electricity, it's unethical to say to them we have to move backwards. And so Although the, that wasn't kind of really what we meant, we weren't trying to stop development, we were looking at a different type of development, it certainly made us consider the language we used. So the human evolutionary history was more about considering what environments we evolved to live in. And so the type of food that we have evolved to eat, the type of physical activity we've designed to have, the, the family groups that seem to be ingrained within us, uh, it was looking more to that, not necessarily stopping development and taking it back. Um, but there was very much that, that strong sense of if you're asking development to slow down, that's not the same everywhere in the world. It's, you may want it to slow down in some regions of the world, but you also want it to speed up in others. Their particular concern was around the birth rate in Malawi, which is still very high. And they feel that actually, if you look, and certainly when we're talking about evolutionary history, if you look at he, human evolutionary literature around how many children the human body is designed to have, it's actually around six or eight. And there are actually health implications to not having six or eight children throughout your lifetime. But actually we don't want that. You know, there, there are good things to development. One of which is we no longer have to have six or eight children in order to ensure one or two of them grow up to look after us in old age. We only have to have one or two children to ensure they're still alive to look after us in old age. Um, and we have to be aware of those kind of issues. Uh, the other one that they, they didn't like so much, again, was really this idea of equity and accessibility. And it, it wasn't so much that they didn't like it, but they didn't really believe that they would have an equal voice in this. Um, they again felt that it was, it was all very well and good for us as Global North researchers to come and talk about equity and giving everybody a voice at the table. Um, but in actual fact, that wasn't really what people you know, often did in practice. And one of the things they did really appreciate is the fact that we'd come to them. And that meant that we could talk to a large number of them. And they said, and I'd heard both from them and from other people at, at planetary health conferences and African researchers at planetary health conferences, that they sometimes felt that it wasn't really fair that they were asked to come and speak at a conference in the UK or in Germany or in USA, which meant that they just got to talk to people what they would much have preferred is that everybody had come to them you know if 10 of the top planetary health scholars went and held a conference that 2000 africans could go to that to them was better than them getting the trip to the us where they could talk to 500 global north scholars um, and so again some of this idea of the the innovation and the future and the, the shininess of the world and, and moving everybody towards that didn't really gel with their reality. Um, and they wanted to make sure that if we were talking of issues of equality, what actually that equality was and how they fitted into that. 
So what really all of that came to is after about kind of process of two years of talking to various people, talking to focus groups, talking to other academics and the process of the, the handbook itself, we did a new iteration um, of the handbook and, and we actually, I say we dropped it, it wasn't really our decision to drop it, but the, the idea of the 12 step programme got dropped from that. And it was really so that we could consolidate things into to simpler headline messages, I suppose, to take away. Um, and we really, with it ended up with five, and these were the, the five headline takeaways from the chapter, which was very much intergenerational responsibility. And you know that was very important because that had come through so strongly from the Global South workshops that that was really the one that was so important to them. Um, and also then this idea of more than human rights, that this wasn't just about the, the rights of the of human beings, it was actually to the, the right of the environment. And, and you've seen this in some of the legal um, challenges, particularly in New Zealand, to the, the rights of rivers and the rights of national parks, that they, they actually have, you know, the, the, the park has a right to continue. And again, this is something that's been very important to me in my work in India, because what we're seeing is that the, the common grazing grounds of some of the villages not only provides free food for the animals, which allows the farmers to be able to keep and raise animals, not only for meat, but more importantly, perhaps for milk and eggs that, that they eat every day, um, because they don't have any outgoings so that they can keep those animals. And if you take away the common grazing grounds and they have to buy in commercial food, they may not be able to afford to anymore. Um, but also that keeping those common grazing grounds provides ecosystem services as well. It provides good drainage for the rivers. It provides green and blue space. It provides shade. And so actually looking at the rights of the environment holistically and perhaps protecting the rights of the common grazing grounds, by definition, also improves the health of the animals that graze on them and improves the health of the, of the people who live in those farming villages. And this really comes on as well to the third one, which is distributive justice. We have to actually make sure that what we're doing is equally fair for everyone. And it's not just driven top down by governments, because very much, as I said, in India, the, the top down government drive is to close down wet markets, to have more hygienic butcher shops. But what this doesn't take into account is there are a huge amount of people in India who live in villages where there is no electricity. And so that if you close down wet markets and you expect people to buy from hygienic butcher shops, that involves keeping frozen or chilled meat in refrigerators, which neither the butcher shop has nor people have in their home. And you can't actually change one part of the system without taking into effect how it affects everybody down the line. So I think that distributive justice is very important when, again, it's quite often the, the, the bars are set both by Global North researchers or politicians in very developed countries or within developing countries by socio-economic elites who sit in ivory towers in cities and don't necessarily go out to the rural regions but you actually understand what life is like day to day for the people this is going to impact. The other one that came up um, that I think is probably very relevant at the moment with COVID is a precautionary principle. If you're not entirely sure what damage something is going to do, assume it will do damage until you prove it doesn't, um, rather than just waiting and seeing what happens. Um, we don't know exactly what damage a two degree centigrade rise would do to the planet, but it's actually probably better we don't find out. Um, we don't want to put things to go wrong and then have to scale back. Um, so let's actually think ahead of the, the consequences and we can tie that to intergenerational justice try and actually, if we project ahead as to what life might be like, right down the line, right down to those rural villages, um, by the changes that we could instigate now, let's make sure that we don't instigate some of them. And the fifth one was, it was the right to know. And that was actually, if after all of this, everything is going wrong, and there's, we can't save parts of the planet, and there are going to be areas that become uninhabitable, Let's actually be honest about that. And let's actually try and work ahead as to how we're going to deal with that. One of the interesting things with areas of the world, if you look at the impacts of climate change, is there are some areas that agricultural productivity will go down dramatically. There are other areas of the world, such as Canada and Russia, where productivity will go up. But there's a huge swathe of the world in between, but it's not going to affect quite as much. So, if you want migration from areas that are going to be badly hit to areas where new opportunity is going to be available, but in order to get there, they have to travel through the parts of the world 
that don't necessarily see this as so much of a problem. How do we plan that now? How do we plan for the, the migration of perhaps millions of Africans to Alaska and to Canada in 50 years time? And is that actually what they want? You know, who do we actually involve in these conversations? How do we actually start to make those plans? How do we start to restructure the world as we will see it? And so that really goes back right back to that intergenerational responsibility. This isn't something we can make decisions of now. These ethics are not today's ethics, they're the ethics for the future. And they may be the ethics for 50 years, for 100 years, for 250 years. And we have to imagine the framework in which those are going to fit, but they have to be the ethics that are appropriate for the context that the world is going to be in, in a future that we may not be able to imagine right now. I'm just going to end with, as I said, although we didn't get much response from Reddit, it is actually still there. Um, if people want to go and start commenting on it now, there's nothing to stop you. Um, we will, there is potentially going to be more iterations of this as time goes by. Um, so please do. And also, if you want to run your own focus group, I can send you the, the documents to do that with. We deliberately designed it so that it can be done offline, on paper, with boards and chalk and stones. Um, it can be done online as well. It can be done any way you want. But if you want to look at those ethics and perhaps look at them in light of the new ones as well, and feed back to us, this is an iterative process and we see this as a constantly iterative process. Um, and that just finally is my contact de details if you would like to contact any of me about this. So I haven't necessarily solved the issue of ethics, but hopefully what I've done is given you some ideas to kind of take away and to understand how ethics need to fit into this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And now we go into discussion and I would like to start with a question to you, which is you talked about that some of the ethical principles you were describing are the ethics for the future. But we are living in a planetary health emergency and it is clear if you're not turning things around in the next five to 10 to 15 years, we're making the earth uninhabitable. So uh, in the last weeks and months, we have started to discuss about the ethical imperative for transformative action to do what is impossible so far and create miracle spaces that we could not consider before. So to really go beyond our rational minds and understand the emergency we are in and stepping out into the open and saying it is possible that we will turn it around. We know it is unprobable, but it is possible and that's where we are acting from. So, and I think there is this question of the long-term ethical principles, which we have to somehow also consider today, but in order to even have the chance to work in this direction, we need to be bold enough to jointly uh, act transformative because as an ethical imperative for, uh, for us to act now. So perhaps something you want to comment on and also Kai, because yes, you have the scaffold, but how about we have to do big steps and not small steps and steps beyond our imagination. So perhaps you can both comment on this ethical dilemma. The one thing I would say is I think you have to look at both together. So there are things that we have to do immediately and there are things we have to do long-term. And so one example would be this time last year, nobody would have said at the end of 2020, we will have reduced international air travel by 90%. You know, that would have been completely unfeasible. And yet we're, we are now sitting here with international air travel having been reduced by 90% over the last year. Let's not go back. Let's not go back. But if we're not going to go back, we have to look at alternatives. And I mentioned that Malawi is entirely dependent on tourist trade. So actually, what are we doing to Malawi, which had suddenly found a resource it had if nobody can go and see it? Um, it's been interesting. You know, one of the things I'd, I'd wondered even before COVID and kind of before air travel is I've just one of my interests has, has always been the East India Company. Um, I, you know, I've just found it fascinating from a historical point of view. But if, if you look at the amount of international travel the East India Company organised and the number of ships they had and the number of people and resources they moved around the world, they did it all without carbon emissions. Um, and so 
you know, can we go back to wind powered sailing ships? You know, is the technology there to do it and, and to, to move in the same way? Um, and actually in terms of it, it may take longer. So it may take two weeks to get to America rather than 10 hours on a flight. But actually we now have the technology that we can work while we're traveling. So does it particularly matter if it takes us two weeks to get there? Um, you know, usually going to, going to a conference for three days would be because we can't take two weeks off work to go to a conference, but actually we don't need to take the time off work anymore. Um, and so move back, there was a, a wonderful line came out of the, the World Conservation Society conference last month, which was um, the world not as it was, but as it could be. And that, that kind of really struck me as this, this is, we, we almost have a blank slate. The world has paused. And there are some things we, we should not bring back. And are we fighting hard enough to look at what do we not bring back rather than scrambling to get back to normal so everybody feels a bit better? So I, I think there are those, there are the immediate quick fixes of let's not go back up to the levels of air travel but long term, how are we planning for the countries that are so dependent on the tourist trade? To the people who actually really like to have two weeks break to completely detox after a year of working really, really hard. Um, what, is the what, you know, what is the future of these industries? And I think that's why it's important to actually try and imagine what the world will be like in the future. And perhaps on, on the timescales, on 10 year, 50 year, 200 year timescales, in 200 years, the population of the world could be a third of what it is now through nothing other than a social norm of the next generation deciding they only have one child, you know, each couple only has one child. Um, and, you know, so are we, are we encouraging some of these social norms enough um, and kind of looking towards how we will get there as well as actually, you know, making things, changing things very much now, changing car, it's, it's, say so it's unfeasible you know it is feasible that I could go out and buy an electric car tomorrow realistically I'm not going to but actually in five years time when I replace my car the more incentives and the more normalized and the more messages I've been given that an electric car is right and the more money is, that has been put into bringing down the cost of electric cars so it costs me no more to have an electric car than it has cost to have a diesel one then I'll buy the electric car and so I think it's looking at how do we move towards the long-term solutions while also making sure that the short-term ones aren't forgotten. Thank you. I actually would like to give you the same question, but since you're a political philosopher, I also would include as part of the boldness to transformatively act is also to reinvent democracy on the way, because there's not an option to go uh, kind of in autocracy or dictatorship to, to, for the reason. So, but again, this uh, taking on this notion of an, 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 an ethical imperative to act far beyond anything we have ever imagined before. Okay, so <laughs> these are big questions, but let me, let me try to say a few things. So, I mean, strangely with, with climate change, um, I'm in a certain sense actually an optimist. Uh, and I'm an optimist in the sense that uh, I think we already more or less know what we need to do. So I don't think we have a massive sort of knowledge gap that we're sort of you know, we're standing in front of this problem and we are helpless. No, I mean we have a we have a relatively good sense of what needs to happen, and there has been a lot of excellent research already. We have a massive issue doing it, uh, and so um, this is of course where then democracy comes in. So uh, for me, the more interesting questions are really questions about how do we make our institutions ready for long-term decisions? And, uh, and that is something we are, we are really struggling with a lot. Um, one idea is to uh, systematically create bodies that are responsible for long-term decisions and that are a bit decoupled from short-term thinking. So many uh, states have, for instance, uh, second chambers uh, in their parliaments and why don't we have a second chamber that is tasked with thinking long term and making long term legislation and that can uh, bind the hands of states for the for the long term? That would be um, a very creative idea, I think. And uh, uh, another thing that we could do is we could have some politicians um, that don't need to be reelected, sort of, you know, older stateswomen or statesmen 
uh, that maybe sit on these bodies that don't care anymore about the next electoral cycle that now have the task to do to do long term planning. Uh, that's one idea um, of of the many things that we could potentially do to um, make our democracies uh, deal better with climate change. Uh, but yes, I mean, in principle, in principle, I think we really just need to get to work and uh, do some of the things that we already know need doing. Thank you very much. So per perhaps, Sophie, we take one or two questions and then uh, I would suggest we move on to the presentations of uh, Teddy and Katie to kind of find at the end and discuss together, kind of because this is all connected to each other. Sophie? Oh, Hannah, yes. Oh, Hannah is it today? Okay, thank you. Yeah, for thanks for so many perspectives. Um, I'll hand some on some of the questions from the audience. So one to both of you, um, how much is it a philosophical obligation to get people into action by ethical arguments? So to what degree is a perspective reasonable saying, if we get people to move into the right direction, is the, an argument or even maybe any argument um, would be worth um, spreading? I don't think you have an obligation all the time to argue all the time. I mean, in a liberal society, no one is under constant obligation to uh, proselytize. Uh, and that would be counterproductive. Uh, but I do think then when important matters are at stake, then citizens have a responsibility to uh, stand up and say uh, something when it counts. And climate change is, you know, one of the most important challenges that our generation faces. And yes, everybody in the right appropriate moments has an obligation to stand up and say that things need to change. That I do believe. Uh, then a lot depends on context, when exactly is the right moment, but it's more than just going to vote every four years. Uh, now it also means to stand up in the public sphere uh, and try to convince others uh, that things uh, need to change now. Uh, well, that's, that's ultimately what I think is, is our obligation as citizens, yes. Jennifer, you want to comment as well? Yeah, I, I was going to say I'm, I'm, one thing, I think definitely the idea of kind of arguing perhaps is wrong, being confrontational, but it, it's that just kind of generally nudging behaviour in the right direction. So, and again, you can see how that's worked, certainly in the UK now, at, although there haven't been any conferences in the last year, but at conferences now, all of the catering is quite often vegetarian. You know, it's almost society has moved that it, it's not really acceptable anymore to have red meat at conferences. And that didn't really come from people arguing, you know, going up and kind of berating people who were taking the burger at a conference. It probably came with, you know, discussion about it at, on the catering panel, you know, talks at the, the strategic level, kind of feed, talking to people and finding what they wanted. So it's and sometimes I think it's just kind of hitting that right moment. You know, when is, when is the right moment when something that wasn't quite acceptable before becomes acceptable? Um, and when you kind of see it becoming more acceptable, escalate that. Um, so it would be, and, and it's little nudges. Um, my local sports center has, it, it has about five charging ports for electric cars. And quite often they're not full. And quite often the rest of the car park is full. And actually it's a really good incentive to buy an electric car because you know you'll always have a space at the car park. So that's actually something kind of more car park could start about, could start thinking of doing, yeah. you know, and, and it's just those kind of little nudges that, and it's, you know, there is the immediacy, we have to do things quickly, but thing, the more things are embedded as normal practice and seen as that definitely the kind of the society's norms, the, the quicker that process of change will be. Which is underlying one of the concepts we had before is that it is very important to increase your sense of timing. So when is the right time and where are the right windows of opportunity, because if you have a good awareness of these you can your bold action can actually lead to nonlinear positive results. Whereas you can be very active in many respects and just uh, always kind of arguing the same thing and then you're not moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think very much we mentioned, you know, I completely agree about the short termism of elected governments. So if you want to get the government to perhaps change its behaviour on something, start talking to the new government about that just after the election, because actually if they don't have to worry about winning votes for another four years, they may be prepared to be a little bit more radical. You know, if it doesn't work well, they can always change their mind before the next election. 
six months before the election, they're probably not going to bring in any really radical new policies. Um, so I think that, you know, we're aware of the short termism of government, but work with that as well, um, rather than against it. And perhaps, you know, try and encourage some of the, you know, a minority party that has a very strong stance can actually have a huge influence on the more mainstream politics. So, you know, pick your timing and pick your allies as well. It's one of the reasons why we will have a big campaign next year, we will have many uh, elections. And uh, we feel when you work with candidates, when they're in the process of getting ready for the election, it's a good time to kind of influence their agenda. So Sylvia, I would suggest I hand over to you to introduce the next two speakers so that we can have a, a good discussion at the end all together. Yeah, thanks. So now we're getting to know two people who are like, who are trying to put this ethics into action, I could say. So Katie Webnitz, she's a medical doctor and uh, studied also public health at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and is currently a research associate for the Lancet Chatham House Commission on Improving Population Health Post-COVID-19, and also at the Pettenhofer School of Public Health in Munich. And she published uh, Le Lancet, in the Lancet, the Pledge on Planetary Health. And then we have Teddy Potter, who is a professor of, uh, at the School of Nursing and Director of Planetary Health, who is a member of the Planetary Health Alliance Steering Committee, also designed her own uh, course at the University of on Global Climate Change and a member of, and I didn't know that this exists, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environment. And together with your students, uh, Teddy created a video where her students spoke out, I would say, like the pledge that Katie launched in the commentary. And we would like to watch this first and then hand over to the interview with two, the two of them. I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity and to the protection of natural systems on which human health depends. The health of people, their communities, and the planet will be my first consideration and I will maintain the utmost respect for human life as well as reverence for the diversity of life on earth. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and in accordance with good practice, taking into account planetary health values and principles. To do no harm, I will respect the autonomy and dignity of all persons in adopting an approach to maintaining and creating health, which focuses on prevention of harm to people and planet. I will respect and honor the trust that is placed in me and leverage this trust to promote knowledge, values, and behaviors that support the health of humans and the planet. I will actively strive to understand the impact that direct unconscious and structural bias may have on my patients, communities, and the planet, and for cultural self-awareness in my duty to serve. I will advocate for equity and justice by actively addressing environmental, social, and structural determinants of health while protecting the natural systems that underpin a viable planet for future generations. I will acknowledge and respect diverse sources of knowledge and knowing regarding individual, community, and planetary health, such as from indigenous traditional knowledge systems, while challenging attempts at spreading disinformation that can undermine planetary health. I will share and expand my knowledge for the benefit of society and the planet. I will also actively promote transdisciplinary, inclusive action to achieve individual, community, and planetary health. I will attend to my own health and well being and abilities in order to provide care and serve the community to the highest standards. I will strive to be a role model for my patients and society by embodying planetary health principles in my own life, acknowledging that this requires maintaining the vitality of our common home. I will not use my knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat, recognizing that the human right to health necessitates maintaining planetary health. I make these promises solemnly, freely, 
and upon my honor. By taking this pledge, I am committing to a vision of personal, community, and planetary health that will enable the diversity of life on our planet to thrive now and in the future. Thank you very much for sharing it. So maybe we start with you, Kathy. So how did all this start? Like, when did you decide that we need to change our ethics and medicine? And how did you end up with creating this new kind of oath? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me here to, tonight. I'm really thrilled to be part of the panelists this time, <laughs> and not just as the audience in the Planetary Health Academy. Um, and yeah, to answer your question, I am a medical doctor by background, as you said, and part of my graduation ceremony was to speak, uh, to recite the Declaration of Geneva, um, which is based on the Hippocratic Oath for medics, um, together with all of my colleagues at yeah, the end of our studies, really. Um, and that was a very emotional and very powerful experience for me because it really felt like making uh, promises that will kind of accompany me through my whole professional life and beyond as, as a doctor. Um, and then uh, over the last yeah, couple of months, two years, um, I more and more entered the field of planetary health and developed the passion for it. And um, yeah, at some point I started thinking about the fact that actually I felt as a doctor, the Hippocratic Oath that I took does not really meet what we need to do as health professionals in the Anthropocene in the current times to address the planetary emergency that Martin mentioned. Um, and this is really, I think, how the idea was born to, uh, to, um, to kind of update the Hippocratic Oath, so to say, um, and also develop um, some kind of tool to help bring about the transformation that we, that we need um, and use ethics for it. So yeah, I think that's the origin. And during the process, what kind of difficulties do you encounter? Did you encounter, and what kind of even like happy surprises as well, <laughs> like to both of us? Um, well, I think the first, uh, the most happy surprise for me was actually that when I wrote this first email to my now co-authors, um, that they were all immediately on board <laughs> and kind of excited about the idea, um, although they didn't really know me before as a person or whatever, but. Um, yeah, so that was actually for me, I think, the, the most surprising step in the whole process. And then after that, um, the most difficult thing, I guess, was to kind of organize ourselves um, across different time zones. But this is also the new normal now. <laughs> and we also got used to it um, since uh, one of my co-authors is from the Philippines and Teddy is in the US. And I went to Germany, so we really worked across the globe, um, had meetings. And yeah, in the end, as with all publications, um, you just have to have at some point decide that you're going to put everything together in one concise draft really and um, I guess that worked out quite well. <laughs> and Teddy you also presented the pledge to your students and probably also to your colleagues how yeah was it received by them? Well, we have a long history of being at work in climate change um, uh, fields and so as, as you mentioned earlier we have a class on movement building empowering a movement around climate change we have um, i'm a, in a director of planetary health for the whole entire school um, we also have a curriculum that we've embedded in all our health sciences so all our physicians nurses pharmacists social workers um, dentists but veterinary medicine students receive information about climate change. So we've been on this journey for quite some time and um, our students are already activated, our faculty are already activated. So when this pledge came out, um, it, it didn't take a lot of arm twisting or convincing that this is, we, we, we need to take this move. So it happened very quickly and we were able to pull it together probably within a week after the, the publication was released. And so besides doing this video, to a question to both of you, how do you, how could you live these ethical principles also in your work, in your daily work as a nurse or as a medical doctor? Yeah. 
¿Ya? <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, with the pledge, we intended to have something that um, applies to the professional work as a doctor, as you said, but also beyond that, um, on what can or should you do as just an individual, um, just apart from, from your profession. Mm, and I think one one aspect that I'd like to highlight is that, um, particularly in the medical profession, we should shift from from the focus on healing, really, to the to having a focus on actually preventing preventing harm before it occurs, prevent disease before it occurs. Um, bef because if we manage to do that, we not only prevent harm to individuals, to people, but we can also prevent harm that's being inflicted on, on the environment, on the planet. For example, by recommending people certain types of diets um, that are better for their own health and also better um, for, for, for the natural environment. So in nursing, we don't traditionally practice according to a pledge. We practice according to a code of ethics, which is quite complex, but covers a lot of different fields. And one of the principles in our code of ethics, principle 9.4, revolves around social justice and health policy. And it calls us to acknowledge that human life and, the, and health are profoundly affected by the state of the natural world that surrounds us. And that we must be involved in environmental degradation, waste, other environmental assaults that disproportionately affect the health, um, health of the poor. And nursing um, as part of a profession that restores health, prevents illness and injury, alleviates pain and suffering, must do so in the context of healing the world. That is right in our code of ethics. So we are ethically obligated to practice in this way. And when some people say, Teddy, you're a professor, are you still a nurse? It's like, yes my patients just keep shifting. So it started with the patient in the bed and patients' families, then whole communities as a public health nurse, then ill organizations as somebody working with uh, changing our healthcare system. And now I'm nur nursing the planet. It's all nursing. So when you ask, how do we integrate these two pieces? It's part and parcel of our profession um, to, to care for the earth, which is absolutely interconnected with humans and all life. And so the pledge is like uh, to speak in the, the metaphor of Kai, one kind of scaffold, but probably to reach the top of this scaffold, you need more scaffolds to reach it. So what are the next steps? <laughs> um, that's a good question. So I think from my perspective, from what I know that's going on, um, there will certainly be more videos produced by other groups um, and organizations similar to the one that Teddy just showed. So, so I think one aspect is to um, get it out, get it to more people, use media, social media um, to just make more and more people aware of it. Um, and then another uh, line of action could be, or will hopefully be, that um, the pledge will actually be used at graduation ceremonies, just as mine with uh, the Hippocratic Oath. I'm envisioning people taking this pledge upon their graduation um, from medical or nursing or any other um, school, or even um, along their professional career, there's, it's never too late to kind of take the pledge, so it's not restricted to graduating from uni, but you can actually do it at any point. And I'm hoping that we can, um, yeah, trigger these kind of ceremonies to really take place um, all over the world. Um, and then another thing that's um, on my mind and that I'm hoping we can spark is actually having an amendment or um, a re we working off the current declaration of Geneva um, and to actually see what we've written in this planetary health pledge also being reflected in, in that declaration, um, which then applies to medics specifically. Um, but yeah, I also just um, want to emphasize at this point that it's really important for me and for us as an author team that this is interdisciplinary, that it really addresses all health professionals um, and that it is kind of based on my background maybe as a medic, but really much more open to any health professional really. And we are hoping that it reaches um, all health professionals worldwide. Yeah, and then I will hand over to Hannah because she has some questions from the audience as well. 
Yeah, maybe a bit challenging question concerning the planetary health pledge. Um, isn't it representing an anthropocentric and not a holistic uh, view as it refers to natural systems as necessary for human health? Yeah, that's a very good question and actually addresses or reflects uh, discussions that we had internally in the author team um, as well. And I think it was just a decision that we made at a certain point during the process. Mm. Correct me, Teddy, if you want to add anything, but my view on this was that um, given the urgency um, of the planetary crisis, really, it seemed a stronger argument or something that is more easily, that people can more easily relate to if it is framed as if it concerns them directly. Um, and we also felt that it might be easier to get the message to health professionals and, and beyond to people, to other people as well, um, if we say that this is about our own well-being, um, as opposed to actually trying to change the value system of people and make them think in this in in the kind of more traditional or the traditional indigenous perspectives that nature and other animals and everything really that surrounds us is equally worth um, as, as humans are right that's that's the kind of worldview that is the opposite of being a little bit more anthropocentric mm, and we are very aware of that and personally i really embrace that concept but we felt that the majority of people would probably not really be willing or able to actually adopt this concept so easily and that the pledge might not be adopted or could not have its impact the way it has now um yeah so that's maybe um, enough to, to answer the question but i also want to add here that we are actually very keen on receiving feedback like this and also encourage people to um, amend the pledge and make it fit for their purposes actually if you wanted to use it at your institution with your group and you have that more or sorry the more the less anthropocentric view um, then it's really easy easily to kind of amend it and use a pledge that really fits your worldview and just to highlight, Kathy did a beautiful job of um, exemplifying a um, scaffold approach, Dr. Speakerman. Um, you've given us a new piece of language that's very nice, um, in that the pledge in its current form is a step that helps people take the next step. So if we asked for something that was um, uh, hard for people to understand or hard for people to grasp, there might not be as likely step into the movement. So. It is uh, part of an early scaffold. Do you have any more questions? Because otherwise I would have one, um, Teddy, to you. Is it typical for your school that nurses engage in climate action, planetary health? Because in Germany, we like have this kind of situation where mostly doctors are engaged in this topic and not so many nurses. Well, hopefully, if one of our movements takes hold, that will change. We have launched a global movement called Nurses Drawdown, where we're partnering with the product, a project drawdown for nurses to um, put forth uh, drawdown solutions to, to draw down greenhouse gases. Anybody can join it, anybody can become members, and the solutions that we chose are solutions that improve the health of humans and the health of the planet. So as nurses start to pick this up around the world, and it is being pushed out through the International Council of Nurses and nursing organizations around the world, um, we hope that that will become more and more common. In our country, um, nurses are really on the leading edge um, and um, oftentimes ahead of more cautious professions that um, feel that they need to be more traditional. Nurses um, are, are disruptors by nature. Okay, Martin, I don't know if you want to add something. I actually wanted to invite Kai and Jennifer also to chip into the conversation uh, in a way, the way I hold uh, uh, the Planetary Health Pledge, that this is one of the ways to step into the ethical imperative and understand that I'm not alone in it, but together with others, which allows me to cooperate on a whole different level. So what is your sense of this whole notion, uh, both Jennifer and Kai? I think it would be interesting from your perspective to hear. Kai, you want to start? Yeah, yeah. I think definitely so, that. Jennifer, you go ahead. Yeah, I think definitely the idea of there being entry points into something. You know, don't think you're going to get people to become 
in a kind of absolutely dedicated from day one, just kind of pull them in gradually. And I think then the more people you pull in, the more others around them see that behaviour. And we're, we're seeing similar things in the discussions around the, the COVID vaccines, that actually maybe don't be too worried at the moment at the people who are vaccine hesitant, because some of them may be genuinely worried if there are side effects. And the more people around them they see getting vaccinated who don't experience side effects, the more they realise they have nothing to worry about. So again, I think there's there's that ripple effect. And, and again, perhaps going back to Kai's concentric circles diagram, um, people may not go right into the centre to start with, but just kind of start to bring them in from the edge and try and shrink the edge. Um, and I think the more entry points that people can see, the more they understand it, and the more they can see something that, that kind of speaks to and relate to them, then the easier the job is going to be. Yeah. All right. We have this we have this idea in philosophy it's called common knowledge and common knowledge is created when everybody sees everyone saying something together and that's incredibly important because uh, we all know that we all know and we all know and so on and so on and these pledges they, they do exactly that um so i think they 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 are really the seed for a new norm emerging it's terribly important that this is a public pledge that everybody is pledging together and that everybody's understanding that everybody else is pledging. And that's really powerful. I think this, this can really change thinking. Yes, I mean, of course, it's on its own, it's not enough, and it cannot also possibly cover every possible ethical aspect. Uh, that was my thought when I heard this discussion about anthropocentrism. I think it's a great question, but I also think it's asking for too much. Uh, so, you know, do one step at a time. I mean, this, this is a really kind of nice symbolic way of trying to change our thinking. And I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, super impressive. And I think it's just one example of many steps that are being taken in the German health sector in the last uh, six months. And you see many medical societies, I think in the broader public, it's not understood that something is building under the surface. And we, when we as medical, uh, as health professionals step out and go into the public and talk publicly about it, we will create common knowledge that can be a game changer. I also invite Sabine to involve yourself into the conversation. She, together with uh, Katie, Jennifer, uh, no, no, uh, Teddy, and me and others have been uh, co-authoring the, the pledge. So whenever you want to comment, please do. Um, yeah. I think I would like to give a last question, maybe because I know Teddy needs to leave and I don't want to bring her into trouble. Also, like, what made you, like, out of the things that you heard during the last 90 minutes, what made you optimistic that we will create planetary health in the time needed? So that means, like, in the next five years, hopefully. Um, I, I was always optimistic, um, even though. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation about feasibility. Um, I, I also am a systems thinker and a transdisciplinarian. So when you uh, study systems, you realize a teeny little shift can sometimes transform the entire system in unpredictable ways. And so what gives me hope today is seeing all of you, seeing that right now there's 602 people on this call and that there's movement building in this area. So thank you for including me and inviting me. And as um, Ms. Sylvia said, I'm afraid I need to sign off for another, another call, but um, con congratulations to all of you who planned this event. And thank you for her, that you were here and joined us as well. And thank you for your work. I think that's uh, to say to everybody actually here on the call. Yeah, Jennifer or Kai or Katie, what do you? Also, even Sabina and Martin. I have a question to Kai, actually. Um, with the scaffolding, I, I really like that thought and also with this feasibility and enlarging it and so on. And to me, it seems like a mixture of um, concrete steps. Like you also mentioned some ways how we could actually change our institutions and so on. And at the same time, it's a bit like a different North Star like the goal setting, like the imagination, where do we want to go? Because like the way you mentioned the scaffolding was also to make something possible that before was not possible, which is also in our mind. It's not always a practical scaffold where you step on it, but rather, and I, I, I'd like you to comment on that aspect because I'm still puzzled a bit. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm also still thinking this through, but uh, but yeah, the idea is sometimes by reimagining um, um, situations, we can also change them. So I find this very striking uh, in terms of what we see as this kind of cooperation dilemma and climate change. I mean, we always think about it in terms of an economics problem uh, because, I mean, very helpfully, I mean, I think that economists have, you know, made really important contributions to this field. But they also taught us to think about the problem in a very specific way that essentially always looks like a dilemma, some sort of prisoner's dilemma or something similar. Uh, but there's absolutely nothing that tells us that we have to think about it this way, because we could change our preferences. And if our preferences change, then it's no longer a prisoner's dilemma. It's something uh, much more benign. So for instance, if we had really more altruistic long-term preferences for us and the future generations to follow us, I mean, we would not be in the situation where everybody thinks, oh, how can I sort of, you know, uh, do the minimum while um, others uh, try to do the mitigation action. That would all radically change. That's just one, I think, small example of the way how we can reimagine problems. Because ultimately, um, I mean, the physical facts are out there, but how we conceptualize it, that, that's all happening in here. And uh, there's a lot of change possible. And that has a lot to do with our ethics. It has a lot to do with our ethics. So we did not systematically talk about the climate ethics today, but ultimately we would have to do that as well. We would have to have a conversation about um, how do we deal with this problem globally? So um, we talked about the individual ethics and Jennifer did that, but then I think at some point we also need to talk about distribution globally. There is a global justice question here as well, uh, but I think that's for another time. And maybe even mention the anthropocentrism in this context, because. Um, José Lutzenberger, the Brazilian, German-Brazilian environmentalist, he argued already in the 90s that it, we don't have a technical problem with the environmental destruction, but an ethical problem, and that our ethics is so restricted to just humans and maybe even certain humans only, and, and we leave out the value of nature of any non-human life on the planet, and that's why we're doing all these mistakes, because we don't value them properly and and i don't mean this in an economic sense of valuing um yeah so i was reading last week in uh, in die zeit a german large uh, newspaper uh, an article which was reframing the whole thing they were pointing to we don't have a climate crisis we have a humanity crisis and also you call could call it an ethical crisis because our current ethics are leading us towards destroying the platform on which we live and this is what we really have to shift. And if you follow this thread, it's really important that for all of our work, we make the ethical thinking and reflection and embodiment a key cornerstone of all what we do. And I, I, I really thought it quite surprising that in all the articles, the ethical argument had been in the lens of planetary health has been so weak. So I think it's really something where we have a, a huge potential shift because once you put it on the ethical grounding, the economy and economics are just one perspective. They are not the key thing because at the end of the day is what we are believing in, what should what is the right thing to do that should guide our actions and also principles and laws and so on and so forth. Yeah. To answer Sylvia's question about optimism, um, I'm optimistic because um, especially Kai's talk gave me personally more words to talk about and also to think about um, this part of the diagram that Ilona Otto showed us, if you remember from Planetary Health Academy, what first round about where the norms and value changes actually sit within this kind of, um, within the kind of transformative actions that we can take. And yes, it takes, it might take longer to actually change norms and values, but if we manage to do so, this is actually the more, most sustained, the most effective change that we can, that we can trigger basically. And also now in my work for this Lancet Commission, where we are trying to think about where, where are the leverage points in the system um, to affect changes. I personally do believe that norms and values are kind of even more underlying than changing governance styles or changing the economic system. No, it's actually the norms and values that drive these two aspects. And, but, and yet it's so hard to, to grasp these and to also um, know or kind of have ideas as to how we can actually achieve that, have these like large scale societal norm and value changes. And both Kai and Jennifer gave me personally ideas for that. And so this is great. Thanks a lot. 
And I think a great thing with the co Corona crisis is that a lot of people have started to ask questions that they haven't been asking for a long time. And many of the normality has been questioned. And it's also, we are now going into Christmas time, which is the time to step back and reflect and to start new things. So I hope for all of us that we will have many, many conversations around the Christmas tree, which are also kind of reflecting, who are we? What is our life about? What can we do, but do it from a peaceful place and not just from a fighting place. So that's just also one of the things where I, I do think value uh, shifts will be, we will see many, many more value shifts in the next year because of some instabilities that we are now recognizing through the pandemic. Um, yeah. Other comments from Jennifer or, or Kai or Sabina? Otherwise, I would say that perhaps to close the session, each of you perhaps have uh, take one or two minutes to, to, yeah, just close or say a few words and also Kati. I was, I was just gonna come back on your point. I, I think one of the things that we really, perhaps kind of COVID-19 has made us do in terms of stopping and thinking about what the world is like is this idea of, is the world what we wanted it to be? And that, I said, I, I was interested before this, but kind of COVID-19 has, has made me more interested of this idea of, of kind of bordered communities. And so for instance, energy generation and water generation within a community, it's kind of off-grid electricity. But so bringing back that globalization, and we've always tended to be I think it's kind of sometimes very dismissive of, for instance, people who don't want to leave the town they were born in, who actually kind of like the simple life with their family and want to stay on the farm that they grew up on. And actually, why shouldn't that be aspirational? You know, why shouldn't it be aspirational now that actually the farm that's been in your, your family for five generations, you want to still be there in five generations time? And so, and I think that comes with a, a different way of living. We've we've gone and it is to do with the development trajectory we've we've gone to the top of the development trajectory and parts of it are good and parts of it are bad and parts of it work for some people and parts of it work for others and actually there's no reason why all of those can't be the solution I, one thing I think with you know if, if any of you have ever done your carbon footprint calculator the, the, the thing on your carbon footprint calculator that will it, accounts for more of your carbon emissions than anything else is the number of children you have you know if you if you really want to bring down your carbon emissions <laughs> take out one of your children and shoot them <laughs> and we're not going to do that but you know I also I think that we're very very bad in the UK and I, I you know I don't know if it's similar in other countries but we're very bad in the UK of accepting that some people choose not to have children you know people who don't have children are seen as that they either must have desperately been trying and it's desperately sad they didn't have them even if you've never asked them people make that assumption or if they didn't deliberately chose not to have them they're, they're still treated as some kind of oddity and actually you know it, it's not only the way that we live it's the number of people in the world is, is one of the real issues and so again if, if we look in 250 years time one of the best outcomes for the world could there for the population to have dropped by about half and actually, if we can nudge towards that, that comes back to if we want to live the kind of lives we're living, there are there need to be far fewer of us doing it. And that, that's, you know, quite often the, the population question is always off the agenda. It's always seen as far too, you know, kind of almost unethical to talk about that. Um, and yet it's actually one of the things that would do the biggest, would make the biggest difference to the world in 200 years time is actually the, the sheer numbers of people on it. And I, and I think that's, that's a debate we shouldn't shy away from yeah yeah i think it's also shied away from because it's sometimes used by people for putting the blame to countries with many children and and like taking away the attention from that actually most of the emissions are from the consumption of the richer people yeah. and and for the next 10 years of course this is not going to contribute a lot right like there we need to do other things but long term of course it it's it's a, it's one of the multiplying factors between consumption and how many are doing this yeah yeah and I, and I think absolutely and if you want to look at bringing down consumption encourage Americans to have one child each rather than two rather than encourage Africans to have five children rather than four at the moment <laughs> you know I think it's actually target it where and you know just show 
show where those, I suppose, kind of where, where are the most carbon emissions happening and try and address the, the consumption of them rather as much as the, the creation. Yeah. Kai, do you have something more to add? Katie or Kai? Well, ultimately, I'm, I'm a political theorist, so that's something that I haven't really mentioned that much, and that's, that's the role of the state. Um, and so interestingly, the coronavirus crisis also gives us a chance there, because uh, one thing that we have learned in the sort of weirdest and sort of also slightly scary way is that the state is back, because ultimately, when you have a deep um, health crisis, the state actually takes the reins again, and, and yes, you can see it can actually do stuff. And all, this, uh, all these arguments about there is no alternative and so on, that has all gone out of the window. If you really have a goal, then you can, you know, also pursue this goal with, um, you know, with the power of the state. And the state turns out to be still quite powerful, actually. And uh, that is something that, you know, we as, you know, well, we, I say, uh, uh, most of us as liberals might be concerned about. But of course, it's also really good news. I think it's better than a completely toothless state uh, that can't do anything anymore. So we also need to grab our politicians and say, this is what we want from the state. We really want meaningful climate action now. And uh, that is yet another uh, piece in the puzzle, I think. Uh, so these are maybe not my sort of thoughts to round it off, but maybe that was an aspect that I wanted as well. Thank you very much. Katie? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Maybe to round it up from my perspective as first author of this piece, um, I would like just to invite everyone, maybe over the Christmas days, as has been mentioned before, to think through what um, do no harm actually means to you as an individual, what can it mean to a group, what can it mean for you, what, be your, whether you are a medic or a nurse or even not a health professional, what does it mean if you're not a health professional, is do no harm still a principle that you can identify with, that you can relate to? And as I said before, I'd be interested in uh, having conversations. Um, write me an email, send us feedback. Thank you very Thank much. You. I, just want to build on, I just want to say a few words on, on Kai saying the state is back. And the question is, who is leading the state? And I would clearly state that Greta Thunberg and Luisa Neubauer and others are leading the states by leading kind of the, the public pressure. So it's an invitation for us to make clear what the agenda of the state should be. And uh, in order to point to this issue of leadership, we are uh, offering again in March a 90 hour course together with the University of Munich and also with many people from the Global South joining in because it will be an online course. So whoever is interested to go much deeper into this subject uh, uh, look at the, at the website, I have put it into the chat. Uh, but I do think it's very important that we learn about what it takes to influence power structures and the states in a way that they are, we are nudging them into kind of the right direction. And uh, this is a, a tradition of the For Future movement and we are part of the For Future movement. So it's one of our key kind of uh, uh, objectives for the next year, also in the election, that we are playing a strong leadership role in this direction. I'm glad you mentioned that, Martin, especially that we didn't say much about power in this discussion so far and the vested interests yes. in, in the game and so on. So like to, to realize the power of the ordinary people to shape the rules so that they're actually advantageous for the majority and for other life on Earth instead of a small minority in the short term only. And it's an ethical obligation to grow up and kind of face the vested interests that are standing against what we are believing needs to happen. Yeah. So this, uh, this is not a, a minor task, it's a huge task to grow up in this. And I also would like to add, because the next session is going to be on two topics that one has been mentioned quite often already during this talk, the Global South. So we're going to have at least one speaker um, his Francis Carey. Martin, maybe you can tell a little bit more about him. Actually, he's the head of the religious leaders of Africa. And uh, he has been working on, on climate issues. For example, he has been a key person in making sure that the Lamu coal plant is not being built. So he's an activist also, and is also very interested 
in the subject because he saw that many of the conflicts in Africa are directly related to climate change and kind of the planetary health crisis. So this is the things he's interested in. They have been participating in the Eastern African uh, Planetary Health Hub, and they have also joined the Eastern African Planetary Health Hub, and he will uh, join us in the next uh, session in January. And together with him, we're also focusing not only on the Global South, but also on women empowerment, because that's another really important aspect when we talk about planetary health. And there we're going to have Courtney Howard, who is an emergency a doctor from Canada and she's also very engaged in the public planetary health community and also a candidate for the Green Party in Canada this year so she can also share with us like many of her experience so we're looking forward to you joining us for the next session as well we wish you a Merry Christmas have a good start into the new year and have a good time thinking about all the ethical topics that we mentioned today and maybe even have a glimpse into one of the readings all of the speakers suggest that. Thank you very much and thank you to the speakers as well for joining us.